The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Josh Gagala from Voltoro. Howdy, folks. Dan Eve, the Crypto Raptor. Good evening, slash morning, slash afternoon from England. And I'm Thomas Hunt from the World Crypto Network. Moving on to issue one, Bitcoin 10,000. The price of Bitcoin descended rapidly this week, at one point falling $600 in 30 minutes, breaking the $10,000 barrier. Recent turmoil in mainstream markets caused by fears of a recession and the ongoing trade wars were seen as drivers in the Bitcoin price movement. But now it's headed the other way. Josh Gagala, what is going on in the wild world of Bitcoin price movements? I don't know. I get a feeling that uh, the whole back thing's coming along and all this stuff's happening. I, I feel somehow it's being manipulated down so that uh, big players can buy in before this whole backed deal. I'm not sure. Maybe not. Maybe it's just Bitcoin. It does what it does. And, uh, uh, you know, that's why people are buying gold on Voltoro. So they sell it again when it's back up. <laughs> I don't That's, know. I saw an interesting tweet from Max Kaiser recently where he said that the entire Brexit scam was so that people could pick up London apartments on the cheap. And then if Brexit fails, you made a great real estate deal. I don't know that that's true, but that I think it might be wishful thinking on Max's part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, the whole Brexit thing is, is insane because we're, we're having to deal with so much overhead right now as a company uh, we're a british limited uh company and um uh, and it's you know operating in europe and all over the place it's it's really tricky so we've got to uh yeah we've got to see what we're going to do there probably move to switzerland what a nightmare you're on the british side of that i was thinking if you were on the eu side you just do what all these companies did with new york and the bit license you're just like we're just not going to serve new york we're not going to serve britain because if you can serve the entire eu with one set of regulations Oh, why would you go to so much trouble to do extra regulations just for the UK? Yeah, that's right. All right, Dan Eve, the Crypto Raptor. Why is the price of Bitcoin doing what it's doing? Well, you know, again, it's difficult to predict, but easy to retrospectively kind of attribute movements to you know to certain things and there's you know the whole world at the moment there's there's the iranian kind of the, the tankers there's the you know brexit there's the china u.s trade wars um there's seems to be a lot going on and uh, we've still got the gilets on you know the, the, as far as i'm aware there's still sort of protests there's the hong kong protests like so there's a lot of un unrest and i think that maybe some people may, might be reconsidering their position in bitcoin because of the you know the other markets the gold markets for example um but also it could be the fear of backed you know when everyone was all excited in 2017 about the you know the institutions coming um uh, yeah everything tanked after pretty much from when it went live so you know very shortly after so there, there may be a bit of kind of repositioning portfolios i'm going to go out on a limb here and explain the entire situation when you think the price of bitcoin's going up that's when it goes down. When you think the price of Bitcoin is going down, that's when it goes up. You are the reason. You are driving this entire thing. You failed to sell 13K. Now it's going down. You're freaking out. You're thinking about selling at 10K. Maybe it dips seven, then it goes 14. Maybe you sell at 14. That's when it goes to 21. It's doing the opposite of what you want. Uh, so it's just up to you to change your habits. And as long as you do the opposite, then everything will work out fine. I mean, the last exit, like the, the last call I'll make on that is mad bitcoins are stopped touring and uh, hence the price going down. A lot it's of very well timed, wasn't it? It did dump. up, and it, it's always one of those things for me too, where I'm out on the road having a good time, being really busy. It's not easy for me to sell everything at that time. I'm never like, oh, I'm out on the road. It's really easy for me to sell it all and, and take advantage of this great mad tour bump. Uh, but yeah, the mad tour did end. Uh, back home, there is another mad tour planned. Uh, people might want to hold out for that. We have more on that at the end of the show. Uh, let's move on to the exit question, uh, the always difficult. 
the price of Bitcoin this time next week? Higher or lower? Josh. Um, I'm going to go with lower. Dan, Eve. Ever the optimist, higher. <laughs> As a special treat, we have an important guest here from Bitcoin Talk Show. I haven't been doing too many of those. We're going to check in with the magical Bitcoin price predictor. Will the price of Bitcoin be higher next week? My sources say no. This is a very pessimistic ball. It has answered nothing but negatively uh, since we've answered questions, but it's also been 100% correct. You can look it up online in the archives. Moving on to issue two. Issue two, billions and billions. Alleged Satoshi Nakamoto, Craig Wright, lost in district court this week and has been ordered to pay half of the alleged holdings of his company to the estate of his partner, David Kleiman. The duo's early mining gains are said to be worth more than $10 billion, with Wright now ordered to pay $5 billion. The judge was not impressed by Wright during the trial, saying his story was inconceivable and his statements were inconsistent. He described Wright as one whose demeanor did not impress me as someone who is telling the truth. Dan Eve, I ask you, do you believe that Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto? Absolutely not. Uh, I do have uh, an extra reason. I've mentioned it a few, a few times before, but it was quite cool. There was a dinner with, with Tone Bays and Craig right there and, and some other people. And uh, he actually said, um, we were talking about this the other day, actually. With, with, he actually said, um, when talking about Satoshi, Satoshi's probably dead now anyway, or something very, very similar. And everyone kind of looked around and, and it was after a few glasses of wine. So, no, I don't think he is. Even without that one, an incident um, that I witnessed, you know, from the horse's mouth, he just doesn't carry himself as that, you know, the, this kind of Satoshi. And I know that there's not a huge amount of writing, but yeah, he just seems like a, a giant blagger. Well, and remember all the things that we know about Satoshi. We know about the newspaper article that was embedded into the Genesis block, Chancellor on the brink of bailouts for banks. Uh, Satoshi's a political person also. We know about the extreme patience of Satoshi waiting for that headline, waiting for that story, then inserting it into the Genesis block, launching Bitcoin on that specific day. We have a very thoughtful person here. And when you look at Craig Wright, the history of scams, the history of question marks, uh, the bad grants and whatever else went on in Australia, uh, just doesn't seem very Satoshi-like. And obviously he didn't impress the judge here. He lost the case. Of course, there'll likely be an appeal on this. Uh, you're not going to give up uh, $5 billion without appealing. I don't know uh, that a case like this goes to the Supreme Court or to a higher court or whatever it is, but you've got to, as a lawyer or whatever for Greg Wright, uh, you've got to keep driving at this because otherwise you're going to pay $5 billion. And just, of course, uh, a lesson from my good old days at BTC Jam doing the Bitcoin loans, never take a loan where you have to pay it back in Bitcoin. Uh, Craig Wright, uh, the price is down a little bit today. Maybe he owes a little bit less than $5 billion. Um, but the, the danger of having that, uh, whatever it is, 500,000 Bitcoin or whatever it is out there that they have to pay, uh, very dangerous to have a loan denominated in Bitcoin. Uh, Josh from Voltoro, what are your thoughts on Craig Wright? I mean, quite frankly, uh, just uh, sign the Genesis block and I'll be happy. That's kind of it uh, for me. I... Uh, sure, someone could have he could have stolen the keys or whatever. But if he signed it, I'll give him the benefit of that. Good on you, whatever. And go and make your different altcoin, whatever. I, I I don't really care. I mean, some of the things I do stand out. Like, you know, here's Satoshi, and if if that's him, why would why why would you give your key? And the judge actually said this as well. Why would you make some crazy? Uh, scheme where you're ha giving people private keys left, right, and center, and then hope like ten billion dollars. Uh, and you know how you get that? You wait for some bonded courier to arrive, hopefully at your door at a certain date. Like what? What kind of a gambler are you, dude? And why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just I don't know uh, use a multi sig um, uh, something I don't know something else where you just hide? You know I don't know. It just seems so 
far-fetched to be able to say, no, I can't do it now because of this, that, and the other thing. And uh, believe me, or, you know, get that. You know, like, he, he just uses such foul language and such. He's just, I don't know. He's a very abrasive person. But look, Satoshi might be an abrasive person. And that 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 could be the case. Like you said, Thomas, I don't really buy it. Um, he seemed to be, from all the readings I used to read back in the day, he used to be well-versed, uh, very, very well thought out. He, he was sometimes had a bite to him. He sometimes had a bite to him. But he wasn't like Craig, who was just the kind of Ashburgery mega sort of, uh, you know, very hard to deal with in terms of, and very abrasive. So I'm sort of rambling here, but um, but I think why would Satoshi set up such a ridiculous scheme and pretty much he's pretty much waiting for a bonded a random bonded courier to arrive at his door at a certain day that's that's the story that's the end of the line well uh, he was clearly watching back to the future when he came up with with that excuse that's what i was you marty mcfly (laughs) we have a bed around the office this letter was given to us over a hundred years ago and like they're just going to deliver it and they're going to show up on his doorstep and it's raining and it's thundering down they give him the private key with the five billion dollars on it and the courier hasn't figured it out and no one's figured out i mean there's there's a lot of security things, but what a uh, what a story uh, for it to be even true at all. And uh, uh, like Josh is saying, uh, maybe maybe Craig Wright was sharper when he was younger. I don't really, I'm not really buying this story. But so we have the president we have now. Uh, people get older, they get dementia, they lose their minds. Uh, maybe Satoshi here lost his mind. Maybe that's why he can't remember the keys, or maybe he uh, got the money, did too many drugs, something happened. There could be some kind of break. Uh, in his system, but I, I don't really buy that. But that's we throw that out there as a possibility. Maybe that's why he's acting so erratically. Uh, I really like the the Satoshi idea that it's more like Tyler Durden in Fight Club, and he doesn't even remember being Satoshi. And uh, he has says you know dreams at night, and he has dreams of math, and he has dreams of code, and he publishes this virus, and then he forgets about it, and he just maybe he has three or four other personalities now that are stronger than Satoshi, and he's working on uh, some other math problem, Planck's constant or something. So. Uh, I don't know. It's all happening out there. Uh, what are you guys, more on uh, Craig Wright or you want to move on to the exit question? Oh, Josh is muted though. Oh, uh, One thing I've got to say about the, the thing is that I found very, very interesting is that the judge actually gave enough of a hoot to read the uh, uh, Shalom signature paper, I think that's what it's called, and, um, and actually... Peter Todd said there was a whole section in the appendix uh, where they tried to explain it in a layman's fashion. It, he was impressed by it. I, I like it too, the work. Yeah, and and what I really am impressed by is that the judge actually went home and read the paper, then came back and said, look, because um, basically <laughs> Craig Wright said, well, I've got to have all the keys and all the keys are in with random people that I, some of them I don't even know. And then I've got to enter them in a certain um uh, in a certain order and then the judge came back the next day and said nothing in the paper says anything about order so why are you telling us that so uh, i mean i was very very impressed with the astuteness of of this judge i gotta say that's baller yeah there's a, a lot of research you can do when you're a judge and there's a lot of research that you can just ignore and not do so it's impressive to see this judge uh, putting in the extra time uh, of course, there will be appeals and so on and so forth. This, this isn't a forever ruling. Uh, but let's move on to the exit question. How much money will the family of Damon, David Kleiman receive from this case? Dan Eve. Uh, I, 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 well, it's, it's difficult to say. If, if, they, they, if, if they said it's going to be in Bitcoin, or it's got to be the dollar value of the Bitcoin. So if it's in Bitcoin, then you know that li- that number is unlimited. It's going to be an insane number in a few years, that's for sure. By the time he's appealed it as well, that's uh, so I don't know if they'll ever receive it because it kind of doesn't. It kind of say that if 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 he is if he does get access to the keys or sorry, he, look, I don't know. If he's got to split it, it means they're kind of saying, well, he's got to have access to the keys. And we, you know, we know that he's not Satoshi and he doesn't have access to the keys. So the Kleinmans probably aren't going to end up with much, unfortunately. All right. Josh from Voltoro. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, if this bonded courier arrives in the rain 
and uh, and knocks on his door and gives him the one private missing key. Uh, yeah, then then he will, but I I, <laughs> I doubt it. And uh, you know, I, I just quickly, I think the something about this case where it's almost he went into this case because if he wins, he's Satoshi, and if he loses, he's Satoshi. <laughs> so I think yeah. there's more a case to sort of say, look, the law said I'm Satoshi, but really, either way, if he loses now, the courts ordered him to uh, hand over 500,000 Bitcoin, uh, then everyone goes, wow, he is Satoshi. And it's just another sort of, uh, you know, a kind of thing to, to sort of convince or to scam people. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, yeah, who am I? Who am I to know? Just sign the, just sign the Genesis block. So, yeah. <laughs> the answer is zero. They'll get zero. They'll get nothing. They'll get nothing at all from Craig Wright. They will never get the keys. They'll never send these Bitcoin. He'll have some excuse. He'll have some reason. They'll get nothing. Moving on. The World Crypto Network has its own audio podcast on iTunes and many other audio podcast platforms. Check out audio versions of these shows and all the other shows on the World Crypto Network at our audio podcast. Be sure to subscribe today and give us a review. That helps more people find the show. Give us a thumbs up too. Moving on to issue three, Hong Kong. As the extradition bill protests continue for their fourth week with no signs of stopping, businesses in Hong Kong have begun accepting Bitcoin, perhaps as a protest against Beijing and their centralized yuan currency. The business rollout comes on the heels of a movement by protesters to withdraw their funds from bank accounts and convert them into USD or cryptocurrency. Josh Gagala, Bitcoin is a coin of protest. Something real or just another distraction? No, it uh, could definitely be real, and I'm sure it is. I just uh, don't know about the numbers. You know, it, it was always this big thing. We used to always celebrate uh, Venezuela, like uh, Bitcoin mass Bitcoin adoption in Venezuela. You see these headlines, and really, it's like two guys uh, in their shed, uh, you know, being interested in math. But um, at the same time, there is adoption, and of course, crisis points uh, are a natural fit for Bitcoin um, when you want to remove the state <laughs> from your dealings. Then. Well, one big, big attack vector is naturally Bitcoin. And uh, when there's a run on the banks, um, there's naturally a way to try and convert that. The only thing is a lot of the um, on-ramps actually use banks. So unless you're going to use local Bitcoins or something like that, and yeah, yeah, good luck trying to find local sellers uh, for for a lot of money and uh, probably the the supply will dry up pretty quickly on the local bitcoins front uh, if everyone started uh, cashing in masses amounts of cash uh, into Bitcoin. But uh, yeah, I mean it it's all towards the right goal. It's all towards uh, mass adoption and uh, all these points, all these things help. Dan Eve, you're muted too. Yeah, I definitely agree. In times of crisis, people will kind of realize that when the government is a potential threat, you need to protect yourself. And you, one way of doing that is putting your assets into something that the government can't seize. So it really is a kind of a wake up call for people to, to suddenly panic and think, how can I get around this, do a bit of research and then learn about Bitcoin. Um, but there just seems to be quite a lot of these protests going around the world. And I kind of think, you know, um, it, it, are we just going to see increased, you know, are protests losing their, not losing their impact, but, you know, usually there used to be like a couple of protests, you know, that, and they had a huge impact. Now they're just prolonging them and they're still not getting the results. Uh, you know, our government's trying to fight back and trying to take control by just ignoring and trying to kind of scapegoat other other sort of things. I would I would push back on that. I think this protest has been effective, especially certain moves like uh, shutting down the airport. Uh, that was a very effective move. They only did it for a couple of days, but they could pull that back out at any time. Uh, we do have reports of Chinese troops massing on the border, uh, sending out uh, videos of them training and other scare videos trying to scare people about this and, and 
it is a not just a scare, it is a definite possibility that this ends with Chinese troops. Uh, I think it's a very interesting protest. Uh, I've been following it since 2014 with the Umbrella Revolution where uh, James Bang and others were able to report from on the ground right here on the World Crypto Network. And uh, I thought that one meant a lot. I think this one means a lot. Uh, but I don't think that it's the Bitcoin revolution that we're waiting for. Uh, when I got into Bitcoin in 2013, the Cyprus event of April 2013 was a, a big thing in all of our minds. Uh, they were being cracked down on. They were losing access to their money. The banks were cutting them off. And the banks were going to make, make everyone in Cyprus, which turned out to be a bunch of foreign money as well, maybe even foreign drug money. Uh, but all of them were going to take a 10% haircut. So Cyprus froze their banks. The people started withdrawing their money like crazy. And we thought everyone was waking up to Bitcoin and waking up to the fiat currency and the economic realities. Uh, Cyprus didn't have the infrastructure to do that. They didn't have the educated Bitcoin population. They didn't have the Bitcoin ATMs or local Bitcoins, which isn't even local anymore. So some kind of replacement for local Bitcoins, like one of the mycelium marketplaces or something like that. Uh, they didn't have all those things. They're not perfectly ready and neither does Hong Kong. Uh, I think we're still waiting for that perfect situation. Like Josh said, Venezuela was not it either. A couple of people mining, a couple of people interested in Bitcoin and maybe some guys at Burger King taking Dash, uh, but not, not the bright populace for the revolution that we're looking for. Uh, but it is a, an interesting case and it does continue. Uh, let's move on to the exit question. Uh, Josh Gagala, this is the hard question. You could just say good or bad. How does the Hong Kong extradition protest movement end? Good or bad? Good. You're optimistic. Uh, Crypto Raptor, how does it end? Well, things are escalating, but I'm, ho I'm hopeful, so I think good. I've got the bad ending on this. Beijing cannot afford a negative decision here. Even though they do control the information that goes out to their populace, they can't allow a revolution like this to have any kind of success. Uh, I think it's going to end badly. I think that people in the U.S. are going to claim they're surprised, and then we're likely going to have a, a T another Tiananmen Square type situation, which the world's going to react really badly to. But look at China. They feel they're, they're boxed up. They're backed into a corner there. What else can they do? Uh, they cannot lose control of their population. And if this is seen as a slippery slope towards that, they have to do whatever they have to do. Moving on to issue four, China coin. It almost seems like the realm of science fiction, but the People's Bank of China is incredibly serious about launching their own cryptocurrency with the goal of replacing cash in the already WeChat-enamored country. The currency will circulate through seven entities, including commercial banks as well as Alibaba, Tencent, and Union Pay. The coin, which claims to have 300,000 transactions per second, doesn't use a blockchain, and isn't decentralized, and claims to be ready to launch by November 11th. Dan Eve, China coin, a game changer for the cryptocurrency industry, a Bitcoin killer, or just another sign that the future of money is digital? Well, I think it's, it's a good sign in... in, in well, obviously not that China coins is not a decentralized cryptocurrency. It's not kind of the, the true public blockchain style, but it kind of legitimizes any, you know, uh, it legitimizes not just the, the technology, but also the the control element that the government, you know, that, that has. And so, for example, Mark Carney the other day said that, um, that the who's the head of the um, uh, you know, Bank of England said that they should be considering, I think the words he used, he picked it very carefully, but like, you know, a virtualized, you know, I don't know, cash service or something like that. But he was basically saying we need to do it. And I think part of the reason is, or in fact, he actually said this was about the, the dollar specifically being the, the kind of global index at the moment. And, you know, China's got a very strong currency and they obviously don't want to see their currency you know, being devalued. And so if they've seen the value in this technology then and the fact that it does uh, take power away from governments, then, yeah, they're going to they're gonna definitely push for it. I agree with Dan. The banks are definitely interested in making their own version. Uh, they're going to have to now. Remember that bankers don't innovate. The last innovation we had in banking was the credit card. Uh, the credit came out, card came out in the 30s or the 50s. Uh, they used to use the big chachunk machines. They would actually just create an image of the card and keep that image and send it along. Uh, so this is their 
way of trying to catch up. Uh, to Bitcoin. They're going to desperately copy this. Like you're saying, China's going to have this China coin, try to replace cash. But they already have WeChat. Uh, in England, you're saying maybe they need some kind of a cash service because maybe this internet thing came out and people want to spend money on it and the banks have nothing to help people. They give them this card with one number on it. You give the number to one person, they steal it, they go buy whatever they want with your number. It's a terrible system. Uh, any kind of, like you're saying, virtualized cash service, you go into Tesco, give them $20, they give you a code, you go home, you pay $20 to Amazon. That would be better than the credit card system we're using. Still not as good as Bitcoin, uh, but you can see their situation. They do have to innovate, but it does feel like they're uh, playing follow the leader here. Josh Skigala. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the whole joy behind blockchains behind the uh, distributed ledgers and behind Bitcoin is the fact that you now have the technology to create your own coin. Now I can create Josh coin, you can create Thomas coin, you can create World Crypto coin. And it's about, hey, who will take this? Who will find this as good money? And it'll compete in a market to find good, strong money, money that will be able to be spent is in as many places as possible. Money that is, uh, is quite uh, stable, maybe. Maybe that's something that the market heads towards. I'm not sure. So if China want to go do this, and obviously they're going to do it rubbish because they're doing it centralized. They're doing it for the wrong reasons. They're doing it for control. And there's really no difference here. They're like, you know, sticking lipstick on a pig. It's, it's just not really anything interesting or new i mean really what's the difference between this and wechat coin really there is no difference maybe it's a bit more operable and more more apps can sort of beg if they can build an app to interface to this stuff but but really at the end of the day it's still centralized nonsense and uh but the beautiful thing is that people are waking up to the fact that you have competition and competition keeps the bastards honest you know having the ability to choose a different currency to be able to instantly swap through something like what shapeshift used to be um it, uh, or or any exchange is just so beautiful because there you really find money the free market finds the best form of money and the best form of money will show itself eventually so bring on the competition i think josh brings up an excellent point here about competition like we were talking about hong kong venezuela cyprus used to be locked into your currency. Your currency is going down in value. You better buy some goods, something that's uh, non-perishable that's going to last because uh, you've got to get out of that currency. You could buy something like a US dollar. Sometimes those are around. You could buy something virtual. Uh, but to have these countries actually have competition for their failing currencies and for people to hear about them, try them out, have success, and then maybe even use them as an alternative, that's that final Bitcoin revolution that we're talking about when a country has trouble and they have the, the right combination of the people, the ATMs, the time, the situation, uh, suddenly Bitcoin sweeps to power. Uh, any more on this uh, issue, you guys? Anything more about China coin? All right, let's move on to the exit question. Early to market advantage. Will the China coin have an advantage over other future state coins or Will going first be a weakness and perhaps lead to failure? Dan Eve. Well, you know, Bitcoin became successful because of the network effect and uh, being an early mover. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, Bitcoin is only successful because it's an early mover, but, but being the early mover could be a good thing. And if anything, China coin could actually lead to the next kind of, you know, the, the millennium or the post-millennium space race, which is the, the cryptocurrency race. There we go. We're going to the moon. Uh, Josh Gagala, your thoughts, early mover advantage. Uh, you're muted still, though. I, I don't think it is an early mover advantage. I, I really don't see what they're doing, really, apart from building another centralized, uh, you know, you can call it a cryptocurrency if you want. I mean, you can call an Excel spreadsheet a, a blockchain as well if you really want. Um, it, it's really about action and it's about adoption. If you're forcing people to use your coin, I don't, you know, sure you can get people using it and adopting it and, and stuff, but eventually it'll fail. 
just like every fiat currency because they can't help themselves but to print more money. Remember taxing stuff, taxing people more is very unpopular with the voters, although you know they don't have that much voting in China. So, but uh, you know, printing new money is uh, not that unpopular because you can still make all these promises of new schools, new hospitals, new bridges without taxing the people. And um, this is very, very hard for governments to to stop doing. So, I think you know, really, I see it as a scale. I see China coin on one end of the scale, uh, Bitcoin on the other end. And in the middle is something like Facebook coin that has uh, a basket of all sorts of shit coin uh, fiat. And, uh, and this is the sort of spectrum that we're across. But uh, first mover advantage, no, I don't see it. I agree with Josh here. I don't think there's a first mover advantage. I think this is more the first horse stumbles out of the gate. But it does set an example that all of the other future state coins will learn from. Whatever goes wrong with China coin, uh, Swiss coin, South Africa coin, whatever coin comes next, will have that problem at least fixed. And uh, when you're looking back, you'll always say, what was the first uh, largest state currency, uh, even if it's a flop? And they'll say China coin. So it does have that going for it, uh, but it's not first equals best. It's uh, first equals first. Let's not forget the Petro. Oh, yeah. The They're Petro. also very first. Or Iran. They're supposed to do a coin as well. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of people have promised me these coins, but they haven't come through on them. Uh, Facebook with the Libra. Uh, for what it's worth, good on you, because we talked about Facebook coin for five years now, and uh, it's nice to see it finally do something. Uh, Walmart coin, not yet, but they say soon. And China coin, uh, I still think it's a fantasy, but they're really talking details now. Binance is writing detailed articles. Uh, it's not a fantasy. It's going to happen uh, as, as much as it seems uh, like science fiction. Uh, let's move on to predictions or story of the week. Dan, Eve, are you ready with a prediction or a story of the week? Um, right. I have a prediction that... Um, HCPP, the conference, the next couple of uh, conferences are going to be pretty awesome. There's going to be HCPP um, uh, Prague. There is going to be uh, Honey Badger Riga, um, and then Bitbrum. We're we're confirmed for Bitbrum as well. So I think there's going to be. I predict there's going to be a good set of conferences coming up. Excellent, lots of conferences, and I was I was going to talk about that too, but now I have to get uh, Bitbrum on the screen. Uh, such a conference schedule. So many conferences. You almost forget them all. Uh, Josh from Voltoro, do you have a story of the week or a prediction? Go ahead. Yeah, I've got a story. Oh, just, very, uh, sorry, I mean, very, just very quickly. Really sorry. I forgot TCD Conf. I've got to mention TC Conf. Sorry, sorry, Josh. I've, I've, no, no worries. TC, TC, TC Conf. Conf in Transylvania. Yeah, yeah right. What, what's their speciality? I don't know. Oh, well, they're, they're but, uh, that's pretty cool. Bitcoin's MCing. Pretty big. Uh, that's pretty uh, big. Dracula's Castle, Transylvania, wow. uh, but we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna plug them all again too, Dan. So I've got a, I've got the screen share set. But uh, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Josh. Then we'll get back to our important uh, conference plugging. Yeah, well, I'm gonna plug. Uh, I'm gonna show my own company here because next week we are launching Voltoro 2.0. You know, we've been running for f since 2015. Uh, Bitcoin and physical allocated gold exchange where you can trade between Bitcoin and gold. So you don't need to go to Tether which is uninsured and unaudited. You can go to bullion, solid gold bullion sitting in a top tier Swiss vaulting facility and uh, have it fully audited, fully insured, and then sell back for Bitcoin at any time in a full order book so we don't set the price. And as of next week, uh, fully built from the ground up for the last year, we've been doing it all in-house, possible uh, cryptos and, uh, and being able to trade in and out and crypto to crypto plus, the market makers so if you set an order in the order book you can you'll be paid some of the fee that the takers pay so screw getting uh, you know paying fees for trading you actually uh, if you put place orders and if you make the market then uh, yeah you paid very cool uh, check out voltoro at voltoro.com and uh, congratulations to the whole team on uh, finishing the 2.0 software that's very cool thanks uh, man man and it's worth it's it it's been a long road yeah i think it's going to be great uh, so yeah, my story of the week is just like John, like Dan was saying, we've got another mini conference season coming up here. Uh, the first one I'm going to is the Working Man Bitcoin Cruise. You guys can sign up for that at uglyoldgoat.com. It's going to be September 19th through 22nd. We're going to start out at Long Beach, California. Uh, we're going to 
drive some big giant boat down to Mexico for a couple of days. And uh, Mad Bitcoins will also be emceeing that, or I will, or something. So, but I'll I'll be there. It's going to be great. Please sign up for the Working Man Bitcoin Cruise. It's called the Working Man Cruise because it leaves on a Thursday and it comes back on a Sunday, uh, so you don't have to take that many days off work. Uh, so it's it's for people with jobs, uh, real people, you know. Uh, then, like Dan was saying, we've got the HCPP, the Hackers Congress at Paralini Polis in Prague. That's going to be oh, it's some crazy date style, but it's going to be October 5th through 7th in Prague. I think they've already sold out, uh, but if you want to go hang out around the convention, uh, the hopefully the entire World Crypto Network will be there uh, because we made a deal with them. Let's see if I can scroll down. We're even on the web page and everything, which we were. There it is. Use live broadcasting partner, World Crypto Network. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we're going to do what we did the last two years. We're going to have hopefully the, the big couch and we'll have the live streaming. We've got to do a lot of technical stuff and make that work uh, because Ryan uh, can't make it, which is a big bummer. Uh, but we're going to be doing HCPP live right here on the World Crypto Network. So you'll be able to check that out. Then, like Dan was saying, we've got TC Conf, the Transylvania Crypto Conference. Uh, I can't. It's a 10th through 13th in October, so it's just a, a week or so after HCPP. So it's good you can pick these up together if you're traveling to Europe like I am. And uh, that's going to be in Romania, home of uh, Vlad the Impaler, uh, the real Count Dracula. I think we might go on a tour of his castle and I'm going to go to a salt mine. And uh, Mad Bitcoins is also going to be emceeing that conference. Uh, so that's very cool. Uh, so check that one out. And then, like Dan was saying, we've got Bitbrum in Birmingham. It's a few weeks later on November 3rd in what's going to be the independent, formerly democratic Republic of Great Britain and maybe some of Ireland and uh, Scotland and a couple other small countries. Uh, but they're going to be very independent and different uh, by then. Uh, so check out Bitbrum at bitbrum.org. And Mad Bitcoins is also going to be emceeing that event. So uh, we've got a nice trend going here. I've got some work to do. I'll try to get some interviews and stuff as well. Uh, hang out with the crew. We'll go out to dinner and drinks and all those things. And uh, just one more thing. Thanks to everyone for donating to the Mad Bitcoins gear fundraiser. Uh, we've been pushing this one up the hill for a long time, but we're almost there. We're 81% towards our goal. We've had 32 donations. So donations big and small. Everything helps. Our last donations were like 15 bucks, 33 bucks, 33 bucks, 13 bucks, 92 bucks. Uh, so whatever you got, a little bit of Bitcoin, you can use the Lightning Network too. Uh, this is through TallyCoin at tallyco.in, where you can have your own fundraiser and no one can take your money because it's Bitcoin and it just watches the address. It's really neat at TallyCoin. Uh, so thanks again for everyone for watching. Uh, we're doing this on Skype. It's a little differently. They took uh, Google Hangouts away from us. Uh, we're still working with a live situation, trying to get it back on there. Uh, maybe we'll do Zoom or Wirecast or OBS or something soon. Uh, but we're just trying to keep doing the shows, and it's, it's harder when they change the technology on you. So uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us. Thanks to Dan and Josh. And uh, I think we're running out of time. So it was a pleasure. Until next time, bye-bye. Ta-da!